welcome to today's uh, introductory psychology lecture on intelligence and intelligence testing. We'll be talking about uh, different views of intelligence and ways in which we uh, assess or measure intelligence, uh, of course known as IQ tests. So first we'll be talking about what intelligence really is. When we talk about intelligence, what exactly are we talking about? Uh, this is a set of attributes used to describe a person which assumes people have ranges of abilities and that intelligence can be equated with certain performance measures like ability scales, <coughs> school tests, etc. Uh, so essentially this is a culturally derived idea about how people uh, we measure and assess people's abilities uh, based on what we might value. Things like ability to do mathematical functions, or remember what the capital of Maine is, or <coughs> the ability to solve problems creatively. All these are things intelligence tests are designed to measure. Gardner has a um, definition which I kind of like about intelligence that it's a biopsychosocial or a biopsychological potential to process information that can be activated in a cultural setting to solve problems or create pr products that are of value in a culture. So the kind of intelligence we might value, of course, might depend on our culture. And of course, this is changing over time. And it's one of the things we see uh, oftentimes as our culture and our technology develop so rapidly, people who had highly profitable um, skills in their lifetime suddenly lose the ability to make a good living based on those skills because what we value changes so rapidly. So this is one of the issues we have to sort of struggle with as a modern culture is thinking about how our economy is often tied to what we value and how what we teach right, and what we uh, cultivate in others leads to oftentimes short-term gain but long-term difficulty because we haven't set people up uh, to succeed for 40 or 50 for 60 years because, of course, it's only a modern phenomenon that we even live that long. So this is one of those things we have to start to think about from a cultural and economic perspective. Sternberg defined a successful intelligence as a set of mental abilities used to achieve one's goals in life given, again, a socio-cultural context through adaptation to, selection of, and shaping of environments. Successful intelligence involves three aspects that are <coughs> interrelated but largely distinct, analytical, creative, and practical thinking. So let's parse that just a little bit and think about the analytical thinking. This is the ability to break down, analyze a problem, and devise a solution. The creativity part of this oftentimes is creatively applying or coming up with new ways to approach problems uh, versus applying the same model, the same uh, methodology time and time again. Being creative means that you come up with new and unique solutions, often based on your analytical ability. And of course, practical thinking is one in which we have the ability to practically maintain things like paying the rent and how do you, you know, make practical decisions. So practical intelligence is our ability to size up a situation well, to be able to determine how to achieve goals, to display awareness to the world around you, and to display interest in the world at large. So this is kind of having a practical ability uh, of being able to interact and understand goals, be aware of how uh, our environment around us may or may not allow us to uh, achieve those goals and figuring out ways in which uh, to do that based on that environment. <coughs> I want to spend some time talking about different approaches to intelligence, in particular what we call the intelligence quotient. So the classic view was developed by Alfred Binet, father of the, who followed the, the, the intelligence quotient. Uh, his name still uh, is on one of the standard modern intelligence tests called the Stanford Binet test. Uh, so Binet's intelligence quotient, or IQ, is where we took an individual's mental age and divided by their chronological age, and then multiplied that by 100. So if somebody's mental age was exactly in keeping with their chronological age, their IQ was 100. If they were behind, that is, their mental age was not sufficient for that of their age, their chronological age, then their IQ would be below 100. And if they were ahead of the curve, it would be above 100. 
IQ is then therefore a relative measure because in um, Benet's views, he looked at what was average for that age and looked at whether or not you were ahead or behind where your peers were. So IQ therefore is a relative measure as opposed to an absolute measure of intelligence. We don't have an absolute way to measure intelligence. You can't take your IQ out and weigh it on a scale. So we can determine an absolute weight of um, almost anything, but we can't do that with intelligence. So it's a relative measure. It, it's comparing you to the rest of the world as it were. So the classic view, one of the problems were a very limited mental skills were used to determine IQ, and often it was very culturally biased. These were things that were only uh, someone with a level of education might be able to accomplish, versus modern IQ tests tend to be less culturally biased because they do include some tests of what we call fluid intelligence and reasoning ability that aren't necessarily tied to uh, education, although those are as well too, which we'll talk about here in a minute. The modern intelligence test we use a standardization procedure uh, in which we standardize the scores uh, using statistical methodology where the mean is 100 and uh, each 15 points is one standard deviation away from the mean. Um, so if we look at uh, what a normal curve of intelligence would look like, the mean IQ is at 100. 68% of the population will fall between 85 and 115. Uh, only 14% of the population will score between 115 and 130. And just, uh, about 2% or so, probably a total of about 5% um, or so, will fall above, actually about 2.5%, sorry, will fall above 130, uh, while about 2.5% will below, fall below 70. So pretty rare to find people with uh, an IQ above 130, uh, and uh, also rare below to find anyone below 70. Below 70 is considered mentally uh, developmentally disabled or mentally retarded, um, and oftentimes uh, is associated with uh, some pretty negative outcomes in terms of uh, overall economic stability. Modern views of um, intelligence include things like the two-factor view. Two-factor view uh, holds that there uh, is a there are two main factors involved in our intellectual ability, fluid intelligence and crystallized intelligence. Many newer views take multifactorial views. We're not going to discuss those, but oftentimes they include things like emotional intelligence and practical intelligence as well. So fluid intelligence is the ability to form concepts, reason, identify similarities and differences, includes the ability to see complex relationships and solve problems. Fluid intelligence is particularly important because it's tied to a number of important outcomes, things like uh, working memory is tied to fluid intelligence, which is also tied to things like language acquisition, uh, mathematical ability, etc. So this really is uh, the type of intelligence that is not defined necessarily in a cultural context, but is defined by our ability to see uh, similarities, differences, etc. So things like word analogies, while they do require some crystallized intelligence, that is you have to know the definition of words, uh, you also have to be able to identify the relationships amongst concepts. So soon is to never, as near is to nowhere, right? As soon is a time concept, never is a time concept, near is a um, spatial concept, whereas nowhere is also a spatial concept. So uh, another a test of fluid intelligence is what's called Raven's progressive matrices. And this is an example of uh, this sort of matrix solve problem solving. We'll take a look at an example from the waste here in a minute. Basically, the task is to determine which of these options in blue will fit into the matrix uh, you see before you. So basically, you have to figure out uh, how things progress for each row and for each column. Uh, this one's relatively simple. The rows and columns progress in relatively similar fashion. That is, each uh, addition adds another uh, component. No components are ever subtracted. Uh, and so, basically, you can assume that this um, 
answer over here fits in here. So you can see we get we have these three, and we add one more. Here we have these three. Oops, sorry, and we add one more. Um, back that up. So we have these three, and we add one more. We'll get that one. So here we're adding one, adding one, adding one, adding one. Same with these. So this one here fits in with the answers. A little more difficult is the second example, trying to identify uh, the pattern here. So the task again is to try to figure out which item fits in with that very last um, column. Crystallized intelligence then is knowledge that's acquired through experience. And these are things like, what is the capital of Maine? Um, what are the steps of the Krebs cycle? Um, what are the steps of an action potential? These are all knowledge, uh, knowledge this is all knowledge that is acquired through experience and is involved in reasoning or uh, practical experience. <coughs> Rather, crystallized intelligence is basically our knowledge. So the two-factor view is that fluid intelligence and crystallized intelligence intelligence are uh, separate but related forms of intelligence. There's also this idea of what is called the G, which is this thought of a, a generalized intelligence. I mean, people believe that there is a general intelligence factor. Some people may be better at specific tasks, but that this is still driven by this kind of general intelligence ability. Um, so there might be sub-factorial um, kinds of intelligence like crystallized and fluid intelligence. Uh, but uh, according to this view, there is still a generalized form of intelligence. One of the major questions behind um, modern views of intelligence is trying to figure out what causes high versus low intelligence. And this is an area in which there's a great deal of research. We're going to spend a little bit more time talking about this uh, here in a bit. The major questions are sort of a nature versus nurture. Uh, there is a great deal of uh, correlation uh, based on uh, the amount of uh, genetic relatedness. So if we test the same person more than once, the correlation is pretty similar to that of monozygotic twins, regardless of whether they are raised together or apart. If we compare that to dizygotic twins and siblings, you can see that while there is some correlation there is in terms of uh, genetic relatedness, it's not as high. But we do know that environment has some uh, level of relatedness. We also know that this degree of relatedness, uh, that is the uh, correlation between intelligence uh, amongst siblings, is much higher for high income households. And we believe the reason for that is that in those higher income households, there is a greater amount of stability. So siblings will be raised in far similar environments under very similar economic circumstances possibly in the same house, exposed to all the same sort of uh, environmental toxins, um, viruses, bacteria, all of that is much more similar in higher income households, whereas in lower income households there's a great deal more moving around, uh, sort of feast or famine times, uh, much greater variance in the amount of stress, uh, etc. And so that's one of the reasons why uh, there seems to be uh, less genetic similarity in um, lower income kids because there's a lot more environmental influence that changes uh, for siblings. So what are the, some, of, some of the environmental factors that we talk about? Well, we're going to talk a lot about socioeconomic status here in a moment, which is directly related often to both the richness of the environment and nutrition of children. These two things are important because uh, they vary quite a bit with socioeconomic status. Low SES parents oftentimes um, have difficulty uh, because they are busy working, um, trying to make enough money to feed their kids and keep a roof over their head. Uh, they may not have as much time or energy at the end of the day to spend reading to their children, um, et cetera. And so it's one of these areas where we really have to think about trying to come up with ways to support um, parents so that they can, their kids, can do better. Um, this is definitely not in any way meant to be a criticism of lower income parents because they're working very hard. Uh, they just simply don't have the resources uh, that their higher SES uh, compatriots have. And as a result, 
um, we can end up with uh, decrements in intelligence that can uh, become cyclical over time. So um, modern intelligence testing does a pretty good job of predicting performance in schools. Again, we don't measure intelligence per se, but we measure tasks that correlate with intelligence. And the two most widely used uh, IQ tests in the modern era are the Stanford Binet and the Wexler. There's the Wexler Adult Intelligence Scale and the Wexler Intelligence Scale for children. These are called the WACE and the WISC. So let's take a look at what kind of things the WACE measures. Um, the WACE 3 has uh, several different subsets. This is the first set of these. Um, first is simple vocabulary. And they're asked what certain words mean. Uh, similarities are basically what word pairs have in common. Uh, information, this test takers ask sort of general knowledge questions. Comprehension, again, you know, basic everyday life problems, things like why do we put food in a refrigerator. Picture completion, the test takers ask to spot the missing elements in a series of colored drawings. The spokes might be missing from one wheel in a picture of a bicycle. Um, the jacket might be missing a buttonhole. Uh, sometimes they're more subtle, so in a snowy scene, for example, there's snow missing on part of the scene. Um, that sort of thing. In block design, the test taker is shown two dimensional patterns made up of red and white squares and triangles, and they're asked to reproduce these patterns using actual cubes with red and white faces. Uh, so they use those blocks to try to mimic the two dimensional pattern. Matrix reasoning, just like what we saw with Raven's progressive matrices, this is a fairly simple one where the black star goes in the lower uh, column. Picture arrangement, the test taker gives, uh, is given a series of cartoon drawings and is asked to put them in order, which tells a logical story. Arithmetic is just that. Uh, digit span is a simple test of uh, short-term memory, where they're given sequences of digits from two to nine numbers in a row, and then they just must re be repeated in reverse order. So this is what we call backward digit span. Um, so, if I read all the digits 3, 7, 4, you would then repeat back 4, 7, 3. This gets much higher the uh, longer the digit span is. And again, this is a test of working memory capacity. Similarly, is, or similar to that is le uh, letter number sequencing. Test taker is asked to repeat that series, putting the number first in a numerical order, followed by the letters in alphabetical order. Again, this is a working memory task because you have to remember all of the information and then try to manipulate that information. The digit symbol coding or digit, digit symbol substitution task is where a test taker is asked to write down the number that corresponds to a code for a given symbol um, and does as many as he or she can in 90 seconds. Symbol search then is a test taker is asked to indicate whether one of a pair of abstract symbols is contained in a list of abstract symbols. This is a basic visual search task. So you can see that's a pretty comprehensive list of skills that are assessed using the WACE. Um, one of the important things to do or to understand is what are the consequences of uh, having a lower or high intelligence? So intelligence test scores correlate with a wide variety of successful life events and accomplishments. This is why it's really important that we try to do everything we can to make sure that um, we can do our best uh, to promote the intelligence of, of the entire population and make sure we're not leaving anyone behind. Uh, so IQ predicts academic performance, occupational status, job performance, and income. There are general correlates with uh, cognitive ability, and higher intelligence scores correlate with being both liberal and atheistic. Um, so these are things that are associated with high levels of intelligence. Um, it, there are, of course, important questions as to why um, higher intelligence people are associated with more um, liberal political beliefs. Um, we'll leave that discussion for another time, but uh, it is something that has um, been demonstrated uh, time and again. Another thing that's really interesting here is if you look at um, the incomes of siblings uh, with an IQ between 90 and 109. So what this chart shows is all these are siblings. This is based on a person whose income is right here. Uh, or sorry, their IQ is right here is between 90 and 109. Uh, their income is based to be about the same. Uh, it's 52,700. 
If you look at uh, a sibling of this person with an IQ between 90 to 109 who has a higher IQ, their income is substantially higher simply because they have a higher IQ, whereas those with lower IQs have lower uh, income. So income is associated directly with IQ. Obviously, this is um, a way in which we can examine uh, familial patterns, um, upbringing, etc., and look solely at uh, the effects of IQ. And you can see IQ is associated with higher income uh, distributions. If we look at um, IQ and population percentages, so we take that sort of middle group of people between 90 and 110, um, that's where about half of uh, the population is in terms of IQ. Uh, these people are, the higher your income is, the less likely you are to be unemployed, the less likely you are to be divorced, the less likely you are to live in poverty, the less likely you are to have ever been incarcerated or been on welfare or been a high school dropout. You can see the high school dropout numbers are staggering for those with lower IQs, which is of course associated with things like welfare, poverty, divorce, uh, and unemployment. So these are real issues that really require uh, important, uh, important work to be done. One of the things we know is that there are a number of environmental influences on intelligence. While there is clearly a genetic component to um, intelligence, there is certainly an environmental component we have to consider. Relative general intelligence is generally stable over time. That is, we sort of stay where we are relative to everyone else, but our absolute intelligence actually changes over time. In fact, uh, we, tend to s we tend to get dumber over time as we get older, and it's basically, uh, it's not that, it's that we start losing executive functioning and um, working memory capacity, and that's associated with intelligence. The Flynn effect refers to the accidental discovery that the average intelligence test score rises about 3.3% every year. This was discovered by James Flynn, and basically what we've discovered is um, as we get better nutrition, better life expectancy, better education, our IQs keep going up and up and up. And so it's one of the reasons why uh, we measure intelligence as a relative measure instead of an absolute measure. So again, if you look at sort of uh, the correlation between uh, initial IQ and subsequent follow IQ in a number of studies, you can see that the farther we are in uh, the lifespan, the more stable these correlations become. And then here you can see after about age 45, uh, IQ starts to drop. I know I can feel mine dropping <laughs> over time. Uh, you start, simply being, uh, start losing some information processing capacity uh, over time. So one of the best predictors, uh, predictors of intelligence is wealth. And obviously we've just seen that intelligence indeed also predicts wealth. So these are uh, somewhat intractable issues. Being raised in a high socio socio uh, socioeconomic status family can raise IQ by about 12 to 18 points, which is pretty high. Low socioeconomic status may impair brain development, and this is mostly most influential in early childhood and at the lowest levels of SES, we'll see in a minute. High SES families are more likely to provide intellectual stimulation. Um, so there's a lot that goes into this, and this is an important thing for us to consider. Um, if we want to try to break the cycle of poverty, we need to probably provide much greater support and much greater stability for families uh, with children because uh, we are taxing those individuals uh, so much. Uh, and I don't mean income tax, but their, their lives are sort of so stressful. Um, they don't have enough resources left over to provide the kind of um, intellectual stimulation that you can when you have a higher socioeconomic status. And so we need to do better uh, with those families. So the correlation between the amount of formal education and intelligence is relatively large. Uh, again, smart people tend to stay in school, and school makes people smarter, so it is a bit circular. We also know education may improve test taking, uh, taking ability in addition to any general cognitive ability. Um, we know that educational effects on intelligence may be small and short-lived. Um, because intelligence is something that is, you do better in school because you're intelligent. Um, it's a relatively what we call stable construct. Uh, it's not really all that malleable once you're an adult. So the time to uh, intervene is with kids with better nutrition, um, better support for parents, better support for those kids. Um, so I want to take a look at some uh, very recent 
uh, neuroscience research looking at brains um, and socioeconomic status. So we'll start with parental education levels are uh, correlated with uh, cortical surface area in the brain. So that is the higher the intelligence, or sorry, the higher the education level of parents, um, the more uh, cortical surface area you can see in uh, brains of their children. And this is these are over a thousand kids that were scanned uh, in these studies, so pretty remarkable. You look at parental income and total cortical volume. Uh, there is a really interesting phenomenon that once you reach a certain level of income, you don't get any gains back. So once you get past, you know, certainly fifty thousand or a hundred thousand dollars a year, uh, you're not getting any marginal gain on intelligence. But these very low levels of income, this is where you get the most increase in cortical volume is at these early areas. So if you look at parental education, it is quadratically associated with left, hippocamp left hippocampal volume with the steepest effects at the low ends of income. And so one of the things you can see is education of parents is um, paying off an increased hippocampal volume, which of course we know is associated with um, spatial intelligence in memory. I wanted to highlight a couple of other findings uh, as we move through this uh, discussion. Uh, mother's milk has been found to increase both academic performance and measured intelligence as well as, well as of course, other health benefits. Uh, babies who are breastfed are shown to have higher IQs than those who are formula fed. Now one of the biggest problems is breastfeeding is a self-selection, there's a lot of self-selection bias. And again, this is confounded oftentimes with SES, that is people who have um, higher socioeconomic status are much more likely to be able to breastfeed, to be able to have even, to be able to um, have the time to uh, pump breast milk at work. All of these things are associated with socioeconomic status. It's an interesting new study that promoted breastfeeding to random mothers, so this is a randomly assigned control trial and they measured the IQ of children whose mothers breastfed and the results showed that babies from the hospital with the intervention had higher IQs and academic marks. So I think, uh, again, the more we can try to look at these early childhood interventions and look at these issues of poverty and socioeconomic status and how they're affecting brain development and therefore uh, intelligence are things that we really need to be focused on. So where are we with uh, intelligence? and? Um, Brain development, we know that socioeconomic status and brain development are correlated, that these are associated with working memory, and this is of course associated with IQ measures and outcomes. So an important question we have to think about is what can we do from a policy perspective um, to try to improve outcomes for these children um, so that we can try to break the cycle of poverty. I'm going to leave you with that note and let you think about that, and um, I will be back with another lecture soon.